Throbbing pain, blurred vision, nausea, fatigue. When is a headache more than just a headache? Hi, I'm Erica Vitrini, and as always, I'm delighted to welcome you to Access Health. Most everyone from time to time gets a headache. But we take a couple of pain relievers and the problem goes away. But imagine suffering from severe head pain for hours and maybe even days, where you're completely debilitated, looking for a dark, quiet place to stay and hide. That's no ordinary headache, that's a migraine. And approximately 10% of the population suffers from migraine attacks. But before we learn more, let's meet our Access Health team. First, he's a distinguished breast cancer researcher and surgeon, Dr. Dennis Holmes. Next, she's our nutritional specialist reminding us that we are what we eat, Janet Zapala. And finally, we have our fitness advisor, Dave Sinclair. Welcome, everybody. Thank hey. you. Great to be here. Yeah, we've America. got a great show ahead of us. Really important stuff to learn. Now, of course, all of us have had headaches, right? But not everyone has experienced migraines, right, doctor? About 75% of people have what we call the average or regular headache, mm -hmm. but only about one in 10 Americans have migraine headaches. Mm. That's a huge number. I was going to say, that's yeah. still a, a substantial amount of people. And you know, when it comes to diet, there have been many foods that have been identified as common migraine triggers. Well, from a fitness point of view, I mean, a regular exercise program can do a couple of things, can reduce stress and also help you sleep better potentially, which will no doubt benefit people suffering from migraines. But I think really one of the keys is block out temporarily in some cases, some of the things that are causing that stress, and that's important for all of us, but particularly people that are suffering from migraine headaches. And I think there's just a ton to learn, so I'm really excited that we're dedicating an entire episode to migraines. Yep. Stay with us. Well, up next, we're going to sit down with an expert to learn more about migraines and ways to cope with them. Stay with us. So we're dedicating this entire episode of Access Health to the issue of migraines. And on that note, we're joined today by Dr. Alan Rappaport, Clinical Professor of Neurology at UCLA, President of the International Headache Society, and co-author of six books on the subject of headaches. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for Thank coming. You. Let's start from the beginning. Can you define what exactly is a migraine and how it really is very different than your average headache? Well, most people think migraine is just headache, but in fact, it's a problem with the brain mm -hmm. that involves many areas of the brain, and it has to do with electrical activity in the hemispheres of the brain, mm -hmm. an abnormality there, which gets into the covering of the brain in the meninges and causes an inflammation and a change in blood vessels. Who is most likely to develop a migraine? Women have three times more migraine than men. 20% of our population of women wow. have migraine, and about 6% of men have migraine. And if you have a relative in the family that has migraine, you're more likely to get it because migraine's inherited. Migraine actually can begin as early as about age eight, and begin as late as about age 50 or 60, but the bulk of migraine is around age 20 to 50. Is it true, doctor, there are actually different phases to a migraine? Yes, we describe four phases of migraine. The prodrome can go on for two hours or even 24 hours before the headache actually begins. The aura occurs in about 30% of migraineurs, and it's usually something visual that lasts for about 20 minutes. And then they go into the headache phase. And then finally, they go into what we call the post-headache phase where patients don't have a bad headache anymore, but it's kind of lingering. And that can go on for another day or two after the headache really disappears. Describe a, a sort of a, a total migraine experience. Five, six hours before migraine, somebody may say they feel a little funny on one side of the head. They may feel something strange and they say, I know I'm gonna get a migraine. 
And then if you're one of the 30% that gets an aura, within usually about 20 to 30 minutes, the aura starts to go away and the headache begins. How do you actually make the diagnosis of a migraine headache? One of the ways we diagnose migraine is a headache that lasts between four and 72 hours. It has to be a throbbing, severe pain on one side of the head. Not everybody has a one-sided headache. Some people will have a bilateral or two-sided headache. Not everybody has a throbbing headache, but the way we diagnose it is it has to have two of those four characteristics that I just mentioned, and then one of three more, either nausea or vomiting or a combination of sensitivity to light and sound. Does an individual have a variety of triggers that may start his or her? Triggers migraine? are a very confusing thing to talk about, but anybody with migraine either knows or will soon figure out what their triggers are. So let's say it's a woman who has a menstrual cycle every month. Mm -hmm. It's very common for her to get into trouble two days before her menses begins mm -hmm. or at the beginning of her menses. Weather is a trigger. Too much pollen in the air or a, you know, just a bad almost. air day kind of thing. So also stress. Stress is one of the biggest yeah. triggers of migraine. We have to talk about foods. Everybody thinks that certain foods triggers their migraine, but the important point is it's not which foods except for you. For you. If right. your it's trigger very is these three foods, okay. you're individualized. The next patient will be different, but not eating on time is the oh, biggest probably, universal trigger. Mm -hmm. Not getting enough sleep, not sleeping on time, changing your time zones by flying someplace suddenly, getting too much sleep. My too much exercise. Say, How about exercise too? Actually, exercise is good for migraineurs, okay. but you're right. Some people have what we call exertional migraines going to altitude. There are loads of triggers, and they're not the cause of migraine. They just trigger off the migraine. Sounds like it can be a disabling experience if it lasts several days. Uh, migraine several days. is one of the most disabling diseases ever. I think we have to see the lighter side of things. Migraines are treatable. So it's what not are curable, sort of, but it's no, definitely, definitely treatable. treatable. So what are sort of the, some of the treatments out there for people who suffer with migraines? The best treatments for migraine are what we call the triptans. There are many other types of treatment, but the triptans have been designed specifically to knock out a migraine when it starts. Mm -hmm. And there are three types of triptans. One is a tablet that you take mm -hmm. and sits in your stomach and goes through your GI tract. One is a nasal spray, which mm -hmm. you spray in your nose and it doesn't go through the GI tract. And one is an injection, which also doesn't go through the GI so tract. What I've heard a lot about the nasal sprays recently. Um, sort of what are the benefits of taking the nasal spray? Nasal sprays bypass the GI tract. It can be absorbed quickly from the nasal mucosa, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing because most people that take a tablet have much longer time to get better. Nasal spray is a way to go for most people. Thank you, doctor, so much. And you can log on to accesshealth.tv right now. Stay with us. As you can see, we can't get enough of Dr. Alan Rappaport, neurologist, president of the International Headache Society. Welcome back, doctor. Thank you for coming here and giving us the full story on migraine. Always. And we're also joined now by our Access Health nutritional expert, Janet Zapala. Thank you so much, doctor. It's great to be here. Well, Janet, as you know, we're dedicating the entire episode to a discussion of migraine headaches, yeah. Yeah. which is one of the most common and most debilitating conditions worldwide. And there are so many factors that can trigger migraines. And there are several dietary triggers to mention. And some are really, really common, like dairy, especially aged cheeses, MSG, nuts and peanut butter, processed meats that contain nitrates and nitrites. Stay away from them. Coffee, because of the caffeine, red wine and beer, they contain sulfites. And unfortunately, for most of us, Chocolate. Chocolate contains a chemical called phenylethylamine. 
it dilates blood vessels, okay. and we know chocolate is a real treat. It has caffeine in it, too, as well. It chocolate. also has caffeine. What about having a diary, a food diary, so that you write well, down? Well, that's a if, great idea. Right? If you have something that, that causes or triggers a migraine, you I write mean, it down. By the third migraine, if you look back at the list, you'll probably find something that's common. So you may a, find three things that a are A pattern. Common. I have to ask you about one of my favorites, coffee. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? It's actually both. It's a double-edged sword. Okay. If you had a migraine right now and you had a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. it would probably be helpful for you. Really? Mm. But if you drink 10 cups of coffee a day every day, the falling levels of caffeine is what triggers it off. It's a withdrawal of caffeine that causes the headache. The only other thing that we really understand is you mentioned nitrates, nitrites, MSG. MSG. Those things have chemicals in them. Well, nitrates dilate blood vessels again. And the nitrates are primarily in um, like wines and Pro alcohol. And no. well, those are sulfites. Oh, those sulfites. Are sulfites. The okay. nitrates are in processed meats like oh, pork, yes. like hot dogs and bacon. You no strong cheeses, mm -hmm. no bologna, salami, pepperoni, and no red wine. And You're stripping us of our ethnicity right, right then and there. So we pretty much covered food. Let's talk about other triggers like lifestyle triggers, like stress, changing of sleeping patterns, exercise even. So stress is a big, big trigger for migraine. In some cases, you do fine when you're under stress and you're pumping out that adrenaline, and as soon as the stress right. is gone, you get your migraine. Sleeping, not only do you need enough sleep, you have to sleep on time, so exercise. A small amount of aerobic exercise frequently during the week is good for migraine. It's good for our bodies. It's good for health. But some people, when they exercise intensely, they can develop a migraine at that time or an hour or two later. For that person, exercise is a trigger. I want to mention the perfume. Certain people with migraine are triggered off by strong perfumes. And it's a problem because you can't control what other people are right. wearing. Yes. The other thing to mention is altitude. If you fly in planes a lot, planes are um, about 7,500 feet above sea level in terms of how they're pressurized. And that's a bit high for somebody with migraine. This is such a good conversation to have because it really is a disability in some way. It's um, one of the most disabling illnesses around. Right. And um, it is unfortunate that people that have never had a migraine and have no one in their families with migraine, they really don't understand and they think the patient is faking or carrying on or depressed or something, and that's not usually the case. Usually when I have a headache, it's enough. So, so good that we're bringing attention yeah. to it. Doctor, thank you so much for all this information. This is fun. Up next, she began suffering from migraines when she was just in high school, and after years of searching, she now found a way to manage her attacks and keep up with her active lifestyle. We'll meet her when we come back. We're here with Dr. Alan Rappaport, neurologist and president of the International Headache Society. And also joining us now is Megan McLaughlin, social worker, a woman on the go, and also a migraine sufferer. Welcome to the show, Megan. Thank you for having me today. Tell us more about yourself. I'm 34 years old. I've been working as a social worker for the past 11 years. I love to travel, especially to warm places, being from Cleveland. <laughs> and I hope today by sharing my story with all of you that I can help a fellow migraine sufferer I understand that even as a kid, you had headaches. When did they become not just a typical headache? When I was a kid, I had a migraine. You know, I still remember um, in sixth grade, I thought it was just a normal headache. I was very nauseated. I was laying on the couch. I just felt awful. Yeah. And then in high school, I had another headache like that, very similar, same symptoms, were nauseous, needed to sleep. And then in college, this headache, I couldn't just take an over-counter medication and then just be on. Right. On the move or on so the way. It's starting to get tough in college. You finally decide to go see a neurologist, right? Yes. Um, you get diagnosed with migraines. migraines. How did that affect you as a, your, your career path? I started my career as a social worker. So with my work, I was calling in sick more often. 
and it was really starting to affect my work and my career. Mm -hmm. So over this period of time, how many treatments did you try? I uh, originally started with over-the-counter medications and I would get relief and kind of be able to move on without my day. And then in college, it was kind of, you know, take over-the-counter medications, sleep, relax, do this and that. Then I was taking vitamins to prevent them from coming on so often, incorporating better foods, but I was still getting migraines. Mm -hmm. So I still needed a prescription tablet tablet, medication, something that was going to make it go away. When did you find a solution that worked for you? Um, when I went back to my neurologist after I was having these types of headaches, migraines, I need something else. And my neurologist introduced me to Zomig nasal spray. Most of the patients that I have on Zomig nasal spray like it because they don't have to drink something with water and they find that they get better more quickly than they would have on some other way of taking the medication. Dr. Rappaport, what is Zomig nasal spray and how does it work on migraines? Zomig is one of the seven triptans that we have available and it comes as a nasal spray. The way we use it is one spray in one nostril starts working on the brain to get rid of the inflammation and the vasodilation or enlarged blood vessels in the covering of the brain, that helps migraine. But I think we might be able to get a demonstration from you. Absolutely. This is not actual Zomig, but it is the actual way it's given. Uh, so would you show us how you take it? I just close my left nostril. I put it up in my right, spray. That's it. And I just kind of wait for the medication to run its course. Mm -hmm. And I know, doctor, you're not supposed to sniff it. You just kind of let it do its thing. Or if I feel it starting to drip a little bit. You take a real gentle breath through your nose. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is to keep it in the nose as long as possible. Right. Some of it will go down the throat and into the GI tract, but about a third of it is absorbed quickly from the nasal mucosa. Who exactly is a good candidate for Zomeg? Anybody with migraine, mm -hmm. uh, with one or two exceptions, people who have weakness on one side of the body with their migraine, or people that have some brain stem symptoms that we used to call basilar artery migraine, they're not supposed to use any triptan, but anybody with a migraine can use it other than if they have a real contraindication to any of the triptan, Zomig included. Contraindications would include if they have any cardiac problems like previous heart attacks or they have a stent or an arrhythmia in the heart, uh, anybody that had a TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack because of a blockage in this blood vessel to the brain, anybody with a stroke-like syndrome or anybody that's had a stroke, um, anybody with a lack of blood supply to any organ in their body, mm -hmm. anybody with peripheral vascular disease, people with high blood pressure on medication but the blood pressure is not controlled, or anyone who uses a, an ergot, which is another type of medicine for migraine, um, or another triptan within 24 hours can't take a second triptan like Zomig. Um, and there's one other medication that we always warn people about. Some people who are very depressed take a medicine called an MAO inhibitor. Mm -hmm. You have to stop that two weeks before you can take any triptan like Zomig. Now, what are the side effects of Zomig? Uh, the most common side effects that some people will complain of will be drowsiness, mm -hmm. dizziness, a tingling sensation someplace, a warm, hot feeling all over, or a tightness or even a little bit of pain in the chest, in the throat, or the neck. So Megan, how long have you been using uh, Zomig? I would say approximately three years. And once I use my spray, I feel relief for me mm -hmm. as soon as 20 minutes. Thank you so much for both of you for coming here and, and bringing awareness to migraine because I think a lot of us were in the dark. We thought we knew something, yes. but we clearly didn't. Thank you. As always, for more information mm -hmm. on the topics discussed here today, head straight to Access Health. TV. The best way to handle a migraine is to let it go and ride out the storm. Right, Dave? Yep. Suffering a migraine attack is tough enough as it is, but if you get a migraine when you're at work or on a tight project with a deadline, it's just that much more stressful. So the best way to handle a migraine under these conditions is by having a plan, which is why we've created our comfort kit. Yoga mat, first off, got the blanket, 
and we've got the pillow. Fantastic. So now we're physically comfortable. This is about blocking out light, and that's why we have the mask. Okay. Now you're on your way to being disconnected. Now with the earplugs, you're really disconnected. Genius. Shut out the light, mm -hmm. shut off the sound. Migraines don't have to take control of your life. Have a plan and be prepared so no matter where you are, you can create that space of tranquility and relaxation until your migraine is passed. That sounds like a wonderful plan, Dave. Can I have those earplugs? Sure.